Hello, my name is Gavin Beerman and I work for Oracle. I'm very grateful to the organizers of the JCConf Taiwan 2021 for this opportunity to talk to you today about the Java programming language. In particular, I'd like to show what we've been working on recently. And because I can't help myself, I'm gonna lift up the curtain a little and show you what we've been working on right now and plan to be shipping in the near future. Now, I work for a large American software corporation uh, that has a lot of lawyers, so I'm obliged to show you this slide. However, for a talk like this, it's really important. Much of, what, much of this talk is future-facing, so who knows what might happen. So please don't bank your company's future on anything you should hear today. Even though this talk is about Java futures, I'd like to start actually with a few words about Java's past. Java 8 was released seven and a half years ago in 2014. Java 9 was released four years ago in 2017. These major releases were extremely difficult to deliver on time because they included so many large novel features. Since then, we've adopted a release model where there's a new Java release every six months, like clockwork. <clears throat> we call these feature releases. Of course, the number of features in a six monthly feature release is smaller than in an old style major release like eight or nine. But it turns out we can deliver a reasonable number of features in each release. So over time, they add up. Using feature releases gives you all the new language, library and VM features and all the current performance and security patches. Moreover, upgrading from, say, Java 10 to 11 or from 11 to 12, it's not the same as upgrading from 5 to 6 or from 6 to 7 in the old days. It's more like upgrading from 8U20 to 8U40. And thanks to pressure from users, many tools and frameworks have realized that feature releases are not major releases that will take years to adopt. We often see popular tools and frameworks announcing support for a feature release before it goes GA. Now we've got a lot of projects going on, and here are some of them. And of course, we're an open source project, so you can see details of everything I listed here uh, online. But today I'm going to be mainly talking about Project Canva, which is a collection of features that we hope will make developers more productive. As we say on uh, the project page, the goal of Project Amber mm -hmm. is to explore mm -hmm. and incubate smaller productivity-oriented Java language features. And much of Project Amber aims to simplify data-oriented programming in Java by avoiding the boilerplate that people hate but keeping the type safety that people love. And as you can see on this uh, page, we've been cranking out new features pretty regularly. Let's take a look at how we've been doing this. We've been taking advantage of the six month release cadence by previewing features before deeming them final for the rest of time. Preview features ship in the GA release and are specified in the Java standard but they're disabled by default. So there's no risk of anyone using them accidentally. As an example, you see on this slide, we previewed switch expressions in Java 12, re-previewed them in Java 13 with some changes, then standardized them as a final feature in Java 14 with no further changes. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to dive into some of these features you see on the slide. Unfortunately, I don't have time for them all. Towards the end of the talk, I'm going to show you some features that we haven't even previewed yet, but we're very excited about. The first feature I want to talk to you about is records. Records first previewed in JDK 14, previewed for a second time in JDK 15, and were finalized in JDK 16. We've all written classes like the one on the left many times. 
class point is a simple data carrier for a pair of integers. We love how in Java we give this class a name and then our points are type check in the program, but we all hate how much boilerplate we have to write. We have to write accessors as we would like to make the two integer fields private as good programming practice. We have to write an equals method so we can compare two points. We have to write a hash code method so we can put points inside certain collections. We have to write a two string method so we can print these points out. This is a real pain. Even if our IDE writes this code for us, we still have to read it. It's in code like this where tough bugs hide. Records finally give us a way to say just what we want. What we want to say is a record consists of two integers. On the right hand side is a record class declaration for a record class called point. And between the parentheses, we state that there are two components, int x and int y. That's it. That's all you have to declare. Everything else can be worked out for you by the compiler. So using it, it's just as if you had written the code on the, on the left-hand side. Let's take a look at this in action. Here's the declaration for a point that you saw on the previous slide. If we want to create instances of a record, we use the new expression just as it, we expect. Moreover, we expect the constructor to take two integers because we have declared that all points have two integers. So that constructor is created for you. Obviously, the constructor argument list has to match the header, the thing between the parentheses of the record declaration. So this second call uh, will result in a compile time error. There is no constructor of this form by default. Record classes provide an accessor method for every component. And this accessor method returns the value of the component. And remember that all components of a record class are immutable. So any attempt to mutate them results in a compile time error. Record classes come with those three important methods that I mentioned earlier, so we can use them in our code. First, they come with an equals method, so we can compare the component values. Second, they come with a hash code method that uses the component values only, so I can store them in collections that need to compute a hash value. Thirdly, they come with a two string method, so I can print them to the screen, for example. Now, there's a lot more. Record classes are just special sorts of classes, and the features that you might expect are there for record classes too. You can write your own methods. You can even write your own versions of these methods that I mentioned earlier. You can even write your own constructor if you like, and we even give you some special compact syntax to do it. Let's take a look at another example of a record class in action. Now, the use cases for record classes are endless tree nodes, data transfer objects, compound map keys, messages, so on. But here's a record class called scored which is declared within a method. Indeed, it is a local record class. It wraps a person object with their score in order to make stream processing that you see in the return statement more readable. So you see here that we create, uh, we convert the list to a stream, and then we uh, calculate the scores for each person, storing them in a stream of uh, scored record objects, and then we sort them and take the top n and then return them. So this sort of code uh, exists is very common that you use rec you use small data carrier classes to store intermediate values. And with record classes, and in particular local record class declarations, uh, you can write this code much more compactly. Here's another feature from Project Amber. This is sealed classes. Sealed classes or sealed interfaces restrict which other classes or interfaces can extend or implement them. 
This provides a more declarative way than access modifiers to restrict the use of a class or an interface. So for example, here, we have a sealed abstract class called shape that has three permitted subclasses, circle, rectangle, and square. The subclass of the sealed class may be final, like circle, or may be sealed itself with its own list of subclasses, like the rectangle class. Or it may be non-sealed, like square. So that's a class that's open for extension. Now the non-sealed modifier really does have a hyphen in it. It's a hyphenated keyword. Evolving the Java language often means new keywords for new features, but new keywords risk breaking old programs that use them as a, a variable name or method name. So we have invented the notion of hyphenated keywords to solve this problem. Okay, one of the big themes of Project Amber is pattern matching. And this has involved multiple JEPs, which in some sense stack up on top of each other. Now the JEP I want to explain in detail is the one adding pattern matching to switch, which is JEP 420. But to do that, we're gonna to need to do some quick revision. So first we're going to look at pattern matching and then we'll uh, look at recent enhancements to switch. And then we'll be in a position to look at pattern matching for switch. So first let's look at type patterns, which were finalized in JEP 394. What does a type pattern look like? Well, a type pattern looks like a variable declaration. Here we declare a type pattern string s. And what is different um, is the semantics. A pattern embodies a test. In this case, the test is, is the value a string? Pattern matching is this process of testing a value against a pattern. Where can you write a pattern? In JEP 394, we enhance the instance of expression. So on the right-hand side of an instance of, you can write not just a type, but also a pattern. If you look at the example code at the bottom of the slide, here I'm using an instance of with the type pattern string S. Now, a side effect of pattern matching is that the variable in the pattern, in this case S, is initialized with the value. So if uh, local O is a string, then S will be initialized with that string value. And so uh, you can use it. For example, we use it here in the print line um, call in the body of the conditional. So a variable in a pattern is very much like a local variable. It's just that it's initialized, not by assignment, but by the process of pattern matching. And pattern matching is a conditional thing. Uh, so a value either matches a pattern or it doesn't. So we've made the compiler super smart about this conditionality. You can't use a pattern variable unless the compiler is sure that it will have been initialized. For example, in the then block of this conditional. Clearly, if you tried to use S in, the, in an else block of a conditional, if this conditional had an else block, you couldn't, be, you couldn't use the pattern variable S because the compiler will know that the pattern will have failed. And so the um, variable will not have been initialized. So the compiler will not let you use the variable S in an else block, for example. Another quick bit of revision is switch expressions, which finalized in JEP 361 in JDK 14. <clears throat> now, prior to this JEP, Java only had a statement form for switch. This is very limiting. So we decided to add an expression form of switch. Here's an example of one. We have a enum class weekdays, 
and then we would like to switch over a value of that enum class. You'll notice that the switch is on the right hand side of an assignment. It's an expression. You'll see also in the switch block that we have a new sort of clause with an arrow. To the right of an arrow is an expression. So for example, if the value of the local day was Tuesday, then the value of the switch expression is the value to the right of the arrow, namely seven. Actually, two other things are hiding here in plain sight that I need to bring to your attention. The first is exhaustiveness. If we comment out that Tuesday clause, this switch expression is invalid and the compiler will give an error. This is because an expression should always have a value. By removing the Tuesday case, there is no value if the value of day was Tuesday. As the compiler can spot this at compile time, it's an error, it's flagged as an error. The second thing that's hiding in plain sight here is that this valid switch expression has no default clause. The compiler has been clever enough to work out that if you are switching over an enum and it sees a clause for every enum constant, then that switch block is exhaustive for the type for the enum class. No default clause is needed. The other thing that we'll come to a bit later regards the expression that we switch over. More precisely, this is called the selector expression in the JLS. Now, the expression is restricted by type. Um, uh, the type of the expression, the selector expression, must either be char, byte, short, or int, or they're boxed versions, or a string, or an enum. So just remember that, we'll come back to it later. Great, so now our revision is over. We know what a type pattern is. We know what switch expressions are. And we know about this property of exhaustiveness. So now let's look at JEP 420, which concerns adding pattern matching to switch. So in a nutshell, it's pretty simple. What we'd like to do in this JEP is extend the sorts of things we can put as labels in cases. Uh, in switch block. At the moment, we can only write constants or enum constants. But what we'd like to do is write a pattern. We'd like to write one of these type patterns. So for example, here we're switching over something and we'd like to say, is this a string S? And if it is, here's some code to deal with it. So the right hand side, is free to use the pattern variable that's introduced in the pattern. Well, instantly we can see something that's going on here. That selector expression was not of one of those less types. Let's say it was of type object. So we're checking whether a value object matches the pattern string X. Clearly, if we don't allow such a thing and we keep the restriction on the type of the selector expression, the utility of pattern matching in the labels will be severely limited. So we're going to lift that heavy restriction. So it will now be the case that you can switch over an expression whose type is either char, byte, short or int as before, or any reference type. Okay, so that's great. So next problem that we need to think about. Clearly, uh, we need to determine in a switch block which pattern matches. Now, in the first example, this is pretty straightforward. Um, 
If it's a string, the first one matches. If it's an integer, the second one matches. There's no overlap between these two pattern labels. But what if we had something like the middle switch? We have a pattern look at, that matches a string, and we have a pattern label that matches a char sequence. Recall that all strings are char sequences. What do we do if we get a string? Which one does it match? Now, there have been languages in the past that attempt to do some sort of best fit pattern matching. But it turns out that this is not such a successful design in practice. So we've made a decision that pattern labels are tested in the order that they appear in a switch block. We think this makes it clear to developers what is going on. But what about that last example? There's something kind of wrong here. We have the char sequence pattern label appearing before the string pattern label. And if we test these patterns in order, any string will always match the first pattern. This second pattern label, string S, is uh, dead. It's unreachable. Nothing will ever match. In this case, we say that this pattern label char sequence dominates the second one, the string one. And in this case, we view this just like we do for unreachable code in other places as a programmer error. And so this will in fact cause a compile time error. Obviously, it's going to be useful to have a pattern switch that contains both pattern labels and also constant labels. So, for example, in this switch block here, the first uh, clause matches the string whose value is hello, and the second clause matches any other string value. Of course, if we change the order of those clauses, we would have an error because this second clause, the constant clause, hello, this would be unreachable. It's dominated by the type pattern. So this would be an error uh, and would result in a compile time error. Now, no feature, no new feature in Java uh, doesn't get complicated by null. And pattern matching for switch is no exception. <clears throat> now, the semantics of switch um, as it exists uh, today is pretty clear on null values. If you attempt to switch over a null value, it always throws a null pointer exception. Now, this is reasonable because there were only a couple only limited um, reference types that you could switch over, and you had very limited case labels. So it was reasonable to say that null was some exceptional value, and you would be better off dealing with that outside the switch. But given that we now want to loosen the types of things that we can switch over, and we want to use patterns, to match and patterns have a perfectly well-defined meaning for the null value, this isn't really uh, reasonable any longer. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we've done is added a new uh, label that you can write in your switch block. So now you can do your null checking inside the switch block itself, inside the body of the switch. So you can write, for example, here, case null, and now you have a clause which handles the null case. You'll remember from our revision that switch expressions have to be exhaustive. And clearly this restriction um, is going to carry over to pattern switch expressions. 
So the example on the slide here is an error as this pattern switch expression is not exhaustive. It only has cases for strings and integers and we haven't told the switch what to do if, they, if either of those two patterns don't match. Luckily, it's uh, very easy to make a switch expression exhaustive, and that's by just simply adding a default clause. So this restriction requirement of exhaustiveness for switch expressions <coughs> carries over to pattern switch expressions. Now we get on to really quite a big call that we've made in the design of pattern matching for switch. Since our users have been playing with switch expressions, they told us how much they love this check for exhaustiveness. So much so that they've asked us uh, many times that they would like us to change switch statements to require the body to be exhaustive as well. Now we can't really do that as that would be a massive breaking change to the language. However, with pattern matching for switch, we can get closer. If your switch statement is a pattern switch statement, we have decided that its switch body must also be exhaustive, just like for pattern switch expressions. So here in this example, we have a switch statement, but it is clearly a pattern switch statement because we see the pattern labels. So this particular example uh, will result in a compile time error because it is a pattern switch statement that is not exhaustive. Again, it's very easy to make it exhaustive, just add a default. And if you don't want your default to do anything, just write default break, no problem. But this now makes your code highly readable. You have a case for every um, possible value of the selector expression. Remember those sealed classes from earlier? It turns out that they come together with pattern switches in a really nice way. So look at this sealed hierarchy at the top of the slide. We have a sealed interface S, and this permits only three classes to implement it, A, B, and C. And class, the uh, class C happens to be a record class. Now, in the body of the method below, we are switching over a value of the interface type. And this happens to be a pattern switch expression. And we have three clauses in the switch body. We have a clause for A, a clause for B, and a clause for C. Now, because of the declaration of the interface, we know that only three classes can implement uh, our direct subclasses of that interface S. So the compiler at compile time can see that this uh, switch block is exhaustive. And so it does not ask you to write a default clause. It is not necessary. OK, so for the final bit of this talk, I can't resist showing you some stuff that we've got brewing. Now, none of this is top secret. We have uh, spoken about this in some uh, white papers that are publicly available. So if you uh, just Google the appropriate terms, you'll be able to find those and get some more details about what I show in the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, the first new feature that we are hoping to bring in a future version of Java is a new form of pattern. So at the moment, I've only shown you one form of pattern, and that's a type pattern. But in JET 405, we discuss 
a structural pattern for record classes. So this is a new pattern form that we call record patterns. And it does two things compared to a type pattern. The first thing it does is test if the target is of the record type. And if so, it also gives details about how to pull apart the structure. So for example, if we have this record um, class declaration from earlier, record point int x int y, remember that we create those just using a new expression as before, new point three, four, for example. Uh, now we can use pattern matching to both check whether a value is a point, but also to name its component values. So here in the yellow box is a record pattern pointing x and int y. Now the cool thing is that we can nest patterns inside record patterns. So let's imagine we've got these three type declarations at the top. So we've got a point record class declaration from earlier. We've got an enum class declaration color, which is red, green, or blue. And now we have another record class declaration of colored point. And color points have two components, a point P and a color C. And now, we can nest some patterns together. So in this switch at the uh, lower half of the slide, we have a case and its pattern is colored point of point int x int y color c. So what does this mean? Well, this pattern matches a value that is a colored point whose first component is a point whose first x component is then initialized to x, its second component is initialized to the pattern variable y, and the second component of the colored point is a color uh, called c. So if you match this pattern, then in the body, the pattern variables x, y, and c are initialized um, with the appropriate values. So this nesting depth of patterns matches the depth of your class hierarchies of your object graph. So you can see that for deep hierarchies, this sort of nested pattern matching give, is a very powerful tool for you to navigate your object graph and pull out inner values. Now I challenge you to write this code without using pattern matching. It's not difficult, but you'll see that it involves a lot of boring navigation code. Moreover, it involves lots of tedious null checks to prevent null pointer exceptions. And all of that can be replaced by this very simple nested pattern. So this is somewhat familiar to those of you who know the story from Sherlock Holmes about the dog that doesn't bark. This is really all about the code that you don't have to write. Now, obviously we would like to use some um, similar devices that we have for local variable declarations in our patterns. So for record patterns, we'd like to be able to drop the type of the pattern variable and just write vars. So here is the same example, except I've just replaced all the types of the pattern variable declaration with uh, vars. So obviously we'd like a feature like that. There are also times where you don't care about one of the record components. So it's a bit tedious to have to invent a pattern variable name for something that we don't care about. So we might well like to add another pattern form, which is perhaps using the syntax of an underscore to mean that this is a value that we 
uh, discard and we don't care about, so we don't need to give it a name. So that's pattern matching for records and special record pattern. But we get a very similar thing for arrays. Uh, we create array values using this nice array creation uh, expression. But we can imagine having patterns to match uh, array values. So here in the yellow box, I have a, an array pattern. And this matches a value that is an int array. And it names the first array component i1 and the second array component i2. So in other words, the array that matches this pattern must have must be an integer array, and it must have exactly two array components. We see in this second example a pattern that's slightly different. It has three dots in it, and this matches an array that is an integer array with two or more um, array components. So again, we see if we get this nice duality between the syntax that we use for creating uh, array values with the pattern for taking them apart. And again, we can nest these patterns together. We might want to write a, a pattern which matches an array of points. And again, we might want to nest a pattern to destructure those points um, uh, it, within the pattern itself. So this third pattern, the one in the yellow box, matches an array of points containing at least two points. And then it binds the pattern variable x with the x value at the first point and the variable x2 with, to the x component of the second point. Now, these pattern forms for records and arrays are simple because we know a lot about the structure of those values, of those um, objects. So a record class declaration tells you about all the fields, and uh, so there are no hidden fields, for example, and it's pretty obvious what the values are. They are just the values got from the accessor method. Now for arbitrary classes, it's not, not quite so simple, but we think we have figured out a way to extend the power of pattern matching to all classes, not just record classes or arrays, for example. So let's look at this example. We have a class compact, complex. It has two private final fields, real and imaginary, and we have a constructor. Um, so pretty familiar, and we create values as always with new expressions. And what we'd like to do is have some way of using pattern matching for values of this type. So we'd like to say, are you an instance of complex? Are you a complex? And if so, please bind, please initialize the pattern variable R with the uh, real component and the pattern variable I with the imaginary component. So that's clearly uh, the sort of thing that we would like to uh, write as a pattern. But how is the compiler going to figure this out? Well, in general, there's no way for the compiler to figure it out. So we're going to have to ask the user to write some sort of deck, some sort of declaration in the body of the class to tell the compiler how to uh, pull apart the value. So obviously we can do the uh, type checking using an instance of, but uh, we're going to require the user to write some code to tell us how to get these values for R and I. So here's some imaginary syntax. Um, so we have some declaration of 
say, a pattern. And inside the body of this pattern, it shows how these uh, pattern variables, real and imaginary, get initialized to values. But sometimes we uh, don't construct new objects using a constructor. Sometimes we use factories. So here's a, a factory, a static uh, method for building complex numbers using polar representation. Now, up to now, we've always seen things come in pairs. We've seen uh, some way of constructing a value, and we've seen its dual uh, form in a pattern. So clearly, we would expect there to be some way for us to match things that have been constructed using a factory. So we would like to write some sort of pattern matching test here to say, are you a polar? And again, we're going to have to be uh, have to require the user to tell us exactly how to extract the values out. So you might see that really this is pretty much generalizing the sorts of things we use getters and setters for here, except that it's multi-value, that we, we have um, patterns that can wrap up multiple, multiple things. But it's much more powerful than uh, excessors because, as we've seen before, patterns compose very nicely. So you can just uh, join them up. So we could, for example, if we had a feature like this, we could use it inside a record pattern that was inside an array pattern that was inside another pattern and so on. All these patterns just compose. Okay, so uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope I've uh, shown you that Project Amber is bringing many new features to uh, the Java language uh, with the intention of making developers much more productive. There have been, uh, we've shown, I've shown you uh, record classes, seal classes, switch expressions, and pattern matching, but there are others too, like text box that I've not had time for today, but I hope you might take some time to check those out as well. Now, pattern matching is often given as one of the superpowers of functional programming languages like Haskell. And um, what I've shown you in the talk today is that we're actually bringing this uh, superpower to Java. And we're bringing it slowly, one piece at a time, taking advantage of this new release cadence we have with feature releases. So we have type patterns, uh, pattern instance of, pattern switch, record patterns, array patterns, and even perhaps pattern declarations for classes and some other things in the pipeline. I hope you've also seen that Java really is evolving fast. Um, and I really encourage you to get involved. Please try downloading some early builds and try them out, try rewriting your code. And in particular, in particular, if you're a library writer, and let us know how you get on. Um, the new release cadence model, I think, works in your favor because you, you can help us to get these foundational steps correct as we build more complicated features. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Goodbye.